Hello and welcome to Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. In past series, we've brought you stories from across Australia, Korea, and Scotland. And now in this new series, we're heading to Northern Europe for Catholic Scandinavia. Over the next five episodes, we'll bring you on a journey across the stunning Nordic countries of Norway, Sweden and Denmark, learning about the history of the Church and witnessing the beauty of the faith present there today. Coming up in this first episode. In Sweden, we hear the story of Elizabeth Hasselblad, the founder of the Brigidine Sisters. She has this feeling that she has to give up everything. She asked to enter the Catholic Church immediately. In Denmark, we meet a refugee who defied the odds to become a doctor, driven by her faith. He talked about the tabernacle, and that was the first time I actually understood what it was about. And I really, it's hard to explain, but I knew it. I knew what it was, and that it was the truth. In Norway, we visit a diverse parish, home to 140 different nationalities. The same faith, but different way to, to, to express that same faith. And we meet some members of Norway's largest Catholic youth organization. The Catholic religion gives them order, it gives them meaning, uh, it gives them knowledge. This is Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. But first, we're starting on the western coast of Norway, where there is a small village of Selja. Here you see small wooden huts, locals would shelter their boats in while attending church. And just one kilometer less than a mile off the shore is the birthplace of Christianity in Norway. This is the place where the Catholic Church was born in Norway, so it is truly a sacred space. And people have been experiencing this for a thousand years. When you get out here, you have a feeling a very special feeling. You feel uh, the, the power or the strength from the bygone uh, days. There is something out there which you can't explain. But this is a place where there is only a thin veil between heaven and earth. With a population of just five permanent residents, Selja Island is synonymous with Saint Sonneva, the patron saint of Western Norway, with many coming here on pilgrimage each year. Ran Hilhun is a Catholic writer and publisher, and she lives part-time on the island. There is only a few Catholics coming here because we have very few Catholics in Norway. So most of the people coming here are Protestants or non-believers. And what we see is that this place does something special to them and to the Protestants. It's perhaps the first place they come to, which is a holy place. And they sense that, oh, this is something different. There is something about this place. What is it? Saint Sonneva was an Irish princess who lived in the 10th century. When the invading Vikings threatened to kill her and other Christians, she fled from Ireland. Uh, and she did like many Irish people did at that time. Other saints have done the same. They put themselves on, in the boat without oars, without sail, without a roar. They, they, they were just in the hands of God, uh, wherever the Holy Spirit would blow them. With around a thousand others, in boats they sailed on the North Sea for weeks, eventually landing on Selja Island off the west coast of Norway. At the time, Norway was ruled by a pagan, Hakon Sigurdarson, who did not permit the practice of Christianity. The story goes that Hakon and his men heard about these new Christian settlers on Selja Island, and with his men went to get them. When Sonova saw them coming, she and other faithful took shelter in a cave on the side of a cliff and prayed to be spared from the slain they were about to receive. At that moment, it is said the entrance to the cave collapsed, trapping Sonova and her followers. Hakon and his men searched the island but found no one. They asked God to save them, and he did. By uh, this uh, cave, it collapsed, and so they went to heaven, and they were not uh, tortured and being treated 
being killed in a very bad way by the heathens. Ranghill has been deeply touched by church history here. She even named her daughter after Saint Sonova, who has had a profound impact on her life. You know, in the Lutheran Church, they do not have female saints. They do not have those big role models that we have. So it's intriguing them to see that the Catholic Church has these w women that we raise up. On the other side of the island are the 900-year-old ruins of the country's first monastery. And although the island is small, the easiest way to get to the other side is by boat. Bjorn is a local from the mainland, and in his boat he's taking us around to see Selya Island's ancient ruins. The whole monastery here, uh, when you think about uh, the, the ground area is actually still uh, uh, intact, but uh, some of the walls and the roofs are uh, missing. Um, so some of it has been removed and some has fallen down. The monastery you see here was built by Benedictine monks in the early 1100s in memory of Saint Sonova. It was built by, uh, by Benedictine monks who came from, uh, probably came from England. We used to say it's the monks, but not necessarily the monks themselves. It might be some masons and their families who lived here and built uh, the monastery. It's hard to believe that for nine centuries this building has stood, a testament to the strength of the faith it represents. The, the storms here coming in from the North Sea just hitting it for 900 years and still it is standing. And to people coming here, it is that is kind of a miracle as well because it is you couldn't believe how could that happen for 900 years just standing there, but it is still a tower there. And it's kind of telling about that the church will not fall. Celia Abbey was a thriving and important center for the Catholic faith. Such a strong foothold, it survived a disastrous fire in 1305 and the devastating Black Plague of 1350. But in 1537, the deadly Reformation brought an end to monastic life on Celia Island. But the community here is hoping and praying that Benedictine monks will someday return and claim ownership of the monastery that helped play such a pivotal role for the Catholic faith in Norway. And the mayor of Selya has even written a letter asking them please to come. So this is a place that welcomes the new, a new monastery and that the Benedictines returns. They have missed them for centuries. Today, Selya Island has experienced a revival as a place of pilgrimage and a treasured Catholic cultural monument. New generations of Norwegians are rediscovering and reconnecting with the rich Christian heritage of their country with six to seven thousand visitors each year. Uh, think a little bit about our history, the christening and uh, before and after uh, St. Olaf and the christening of Western Norway and um, what effect that has had on, uh, on uh, the Nordic and the Norwegian society. And every 8th of July, on the feast day of St. Sonova, pilgrims come in their boats to the island to celebrate Mass in the ruins of the monastery. It's really a day where, when the church comes alive. It is always a Catholic Mass here, and you celebrate uh, together with the invisible church, and you feel the presence of the holy people who have lived here. They come and pray and sing songs of worship in honour of St. Sonova, who landed here on this island and brought Christianity to Norway over a thousand years ago. Lauda Mater Ecclesiam, qui martyrum per vulnerum. You just come and you have your time in solitude with God, and it's a wonderful place to seek God. Amen. Amen. 
You're watching Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. Next, we're heading to Sweden to learn about the Brigidine sisters and their founder, Elizabeth Hasselblad. The Order of the Most Holy Saviour of St. Bridget, otherwise known as the Brigitines, traces its roots all the way back to the early 1300s, when Bridget of Sweden created the monastic rule for Brigidine sisters. These rules guide people who are searching for God in a religious community. It would be years later that a Swedish woman named Elizabeth Hasselblad, born Lutheran, would go on to reform the Order of St. Bridget. Here, situated about 10 kilometers northeast of Stockholm, is Hursum Convent, where Sister Beata is a Brigidine sister, faithfully living out the mission of their order. To glorify God with the, the, the prayers, that is the first task. And then with the guest house, to welcome people of all, all beliefs, to make them feel at home. The convent is also a guest house and was founded by Mother Elizabeth, now Saint Elizabeth Hasselblad, in 1923, when it was not permitted to have convents in Sweden. So she would not say she was establishing a convent, and instead she had to call it a resting house. Mother Elizabeth had grown up Lutheran in Sweden, but when she turned 18, she emigrated to America. She traveled to New York, and within a few hours, she landed her first job, working with a family. But she wasn't happy. She writes home that she has new friends. There's no other one that speaks Swedish or not even a Scandinavian language. After about a year, she became ill and was hospitalized in New York. It was there that she asked God, help me to stand on my feet and I will see that no one else will have to suffer the way that I have suffered now. After six weeks, she could leave the hospital and she rolled in for the nursery school and became a nurse. It was as a nurse in Roosevelt Hospital that she came into contact with the Catholic faith, treating her patients, many of whom were Catholic. She would talk to them about their faith and then decided to convert. She was really founded in this that a Catholic church is a truth church. Then was no hesitation. She asked to enter the Catholic church immediately. She converted to the Catholic faith in 1902, and while on a trip to Rome, she came across the home of St. Bridget of Sweden, where some Carmelite nuns were living. It was here she felt the calling to sisterhood. She wrote to the sisters, asking if she could come to live with them, and they welcomed her with open arms. She went to Rome to live with the Carmelites, and then successfully petitioned the Holy See to make religious vows under the rule of the Brigittine Order. But because of the illness she had had in New York and the promise she had made to God that if she was healed, she would take care of others, she wanted to open up the convent to allow people to stay with them who were in need of help. The other sisters were not too keen on this, and so Sister Elizabeth and three other young women from England together established a new convent in Rome. First to a house on, close to St. Peter's, then to another house in the other part of Rome, and only in 1919, after eight years, she could buy another house. That is our first and oldest convent. She had achieved her goal of setting up a Brigittine convent in Rome, but she still wanted to bring the sisters back to her home country of Sweden. And so in 1923, she returned and established this community in Jersholm. Today, Sister Beata and all the other sisters are continuing the work of Mother Elizabeth. You're watching Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. With you, the sun is shining 24-7. It can, of course, be very difficult for young people to hold on to their faith in an increasingly secular world. In Norway, the National Catholic Youth Organization, NUK, promotes events for young Catholics across the country. Stephen Trotter is the Secretary General. NUK was founded on Pentecost 1947, so 25th of May 1947. 
which uh, means it's about 72 years old this year. The aim of NUK is simple, bring young Catholics together so they can help each other stay strong in their faith. A lot of central activities that sort of brought them together in one place and gave them an opportunity to meet other young Catholics and uh, give them that refill that they needed to keep the faith with them in their everyday life. They have different groups within NUK, youth groups with many social activities and student groups with more faith-focused meetings. The student groups usually get together for a bit more mature activities, sort of in terms of like having theological discussions or debates or lectures or guest lectures and stuff like that. NUK also organizes summer camps, which are just like any other summer camps, but with morning prayers and daily mass. And these camps follow the same format usually in terms of morning prayers, breakfast, bit of catechesis, bit of fun activities and socialising. We also provide leadership training, so youth leadership training, and that is to help these young adults and 15 to 18 year olds develop uh, their faith and to grow in it and mature in it and to give them a better starting point for then spreading it. Each Sunday after Mass, these young people meet up on the steps of the church. Alessandro Vidanes is 17 and very active in the NUK youth groups. I think that young people, especially my age, um, are looking for meaning in their lives. The Catholic religion gives them order, it gives them meaning, uh, it gives them knowledge uh, on how to live your life and how to tackle all the problems that are existence kind of uh, throws at us. Miriam Doherty and Aoife Ong are both students from the University of Glasgow in Scotland and are here volunteering with Caritas. For me it's been absolutely wonderful, you know, very inspirational to see these young people here. It's nice to know as well that I'm not the only one in the entire world, you know, people in Norway are doing it, people back in Malaysia are doing it, people in Scotland are doing it. And I think it's good for them to see as well that two girls from Scotland came over and are also seeking out the will of God and it just puts so, more, so much perspective on the universality of the Catholic Church. There's so many volunteers that are very involved and are giving up a lot of their free time to catechize the younger children, to participate in the Mass through altar serving and through other devotions. I've been traveling around quite a lot actually over the summer. I've been to Korea, I've been to Uganda, and it seems that the youth are really on fire, you know, and you can really see them longing for the truth, um, longing for orthodoxy, longing for the church's teachings. You know, so many people in the whole world is actually telling us that, you know, the Catholic Church is becoming irrelevant and it's dying out, but there's so many youth worldwide who really do care about the Catholic Church. When the truth is shown without hesitation, young people really do respond to it and they can see for themselves that this is what is true and this is where they belong. This is Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. In the city of Bergen, St. Paul's is a large parish of 20,000 members and each Sunday they have as many as seven to eight masses. But what makes this parish special is its diverse congregation, made up of over 140 different nationalities. My name is Sister Gorati. My name is Sister Teresa. We are, we are from, from Vietnam. Vietnam. My name is Turil. I'm from Norway. I came from Hungary. From Vietnam. From Norway. From the Philippines. Eritrea. I'm from the United States. From Italy. From Vietnam the Philippines, Mabuhay. This is truly a global parish with members from all over the world and one of the many priests serving here is Father Eric Andreas Holt. Usual Sunday we have seven to eight masses in different languages. Two Norwegian masses, two Polish masses and the other masses in different nationalities. Catholics around the world have many different ways of expressing their faith and here at St. Paul's you get a unique opportunity to see the whole world's church in one place. It would be very nice for me as a former Lutheran to, 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 to look at the, the, the diversity within this congregation. The same faith but different way to, to, to express that same faith. 
Father Eric was married when in the Lutheran Church, so when he converted to Catholicism and wanted to become a priest, he faced a unique challenge. There are only four other married priests in the entire country. Father Eric wrote to the Pope to seek approval and eventually got permission to become a priest. I had to go uh, to Austria twice because they were a little afraid in, in the Holy See of too many married priests within a country with rather few Catholics. In 2016, I was allowed to, to proceed my, my service as a priest. When Father Eric converted from the Lutheran Church to the Catholic Church, he said that he found a home and felt that he had found the truth. I hope that the younger people in our congregation will grow up in the faith to express their faith and live their faith. This is Catholic Scandinavia on EWTN. Next, we bring you a story from Denmark of how one woman defied the odds to be successful in life, driven by her strong faith. Of course, it's hard if somebody asks you, why did my daughter have to die? I've seen young kids die in drowning accidents and car accidents. I really, I think there is a reason with everything. Maybe losing someone will bring the rest of the family closer, maybe. Without dark, you can't appreciate light. Dr. Matea Leiden is training to be a heart and lung surgeon here at the Copenhagen University Hospital in Denmark. And at only 30 years of age, she is an impressive woman, working in a mainly male-dominated field. For as long as I can remember, I've been dreaming of being a doctor, which is strange, because I don't know how you as that small can know that for sure. I think part of it is because we've been raised to have to do meaningful stuff. So uh, it was a calling because it felt like, for me, like the most meaningful job I could have. But what's even more impressive is the path she has had to take to get to where she is in life. Yugoslavia, 1991. When communism fell, a bloody war broke out as the country started to split into separate states. Matea and her family were living in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and when she was two, her mother Lucia took her and her sister and fled. So me and my parents fled to Sweden. Me and my, my mom and my sister fled. My dad couldn't. Matea's mother Lucia had taken the girls and fled as refugees to Sweden. Her father, Jozo, had to stay behind. All the male had to stay and fight, because it was, a, as I said, a bad war. And the there was a possibility she, he wouldn't come. As war refugees now living in Malmo, Sweden, Matea and her sister and their mother grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods in the country. We came as refugees. My, the, the parents didn't have an education here. They didn't know the language and uh, you never really felt 100% at home or Swedish. Matea was attending a struggling school in the neighborhood and the idea of a student from a school like this going on to become a doctor was unheard of. I went to these, if you can call them ghetto schools, and then to become a doctor I had to go at a good uh, high school, of course, and so I applied for the best in Malmö. And I remember when I came to an information meeting with my mom, and I said, like my background, where I studied now, where I was from. He said, uh, I don't mean to offend you, but maybe you should go for a nurse or sub-nurse. And I like when people underestimate me. Then I like to prove them wrong, and it makes me a hard worker. And underestimate Matea they did. Despite her background, she was accepted and enrolled in one of the best high schools in Malmo, where she started to excel in her schoolwork. Matea's family were Catholic, but it was more cultural and not something they practiced or took very seriously. I didn't know what my faith was about. I didn't know it. It was just like, as I said, for the average immigrant Catholic family, that it's a part of your culture identity, but it's not something you think about or practice. Matea attended World Youth Day in Germany in 2005, and it was here her life was to change forever while sitting in a church with a group of young people. I remember one day when we were sitting in church, 
and everybody was talking and making a lot of noise. And a monk, one of, in the Swedish group said, don't you understand that you're sitting in front of what you're sitting in front of and showing so little respect. And he talked about the tabernacle. And that was the first time I actually understood what it was about. And I really, it's hard to explain, but I knew it. I knew what it was and that it was the truth. Matea sat in front of the tabernacle for some time, taking in what she had just heard from the monk. I understood it, the depth to it just made sense because I'm a very scientifically minded person. Matea continued to study hard at school, driven by the dream of being a doctor and helping others. But with her background, she needed to be more than exceptional if her dream was to become a reality. She worked hard and it paid off. I read almost the, the double amount of uh, courses that you needed to read and got the highest grade in all of them. Got a scholarship in the end for the best grades ever in history of that school. She attended Lund University for a while where she studied mathematics and physics before she went on to study medicine at the University of Copenhagen. Currently, she is working in the University Hospital in Copenhagen as a resident physician and, all going well, will be a cardiothoracic surgeon in the near future. And despite all the medical challenges facing the world today, Matea trusts God will watch over her during these uncertain times as she faithfully fights to save lives. That's it for this first episode of Catholic Scandinavia. Coming up in our next episode, we visit a family in the beautiful Swedish countryside who built a chapel on their farm. So we have to do it ourselves and I like building. In the city of Trondheim in Norway, we meet a Catholic priest with a fascinating story. As almost all Norwegian-born Catholics, I'm a convert. And in Copenhagen, we meet the Bishop of all of Denmark. The truth should be um, proclaimed without reservation. Thanks for watching and see you next time on Catholic Scandinavia.